Hello, this is Kyrasis, and in this Dungeon Mechanics video, we'll be going through all trash mechanics in Ruby Life Pools, so you can get a good idea of what is actually going on in this dungeon. The first enemy you will encounter is the Primal Juggernaut, who has two abilities. The first ability is Crushing Smash, a high physical damage tank buster with a 1 second cast time. What the tooltip won't tell you is that this is used as often as every 8.5 seconds, so it can happen quite frequently. The second ability is Excavating Blast, a 2.5 second cast time avoidable AoE ability that is used on a random target. Anyone caught in the blast will take high nature damage along with a knockback effect. Like Crushing Smash, this ability is used every 8.5 seconds, and after the AoE occurs, a Jagged Earth ground effect is left in its place, which deals moderate ticking damage to players who remain in the area along with a light snare. The next enemy is the Primal Terra Sentry, that looks like a small earth elemental with a sword and shield. These melee enemies only have one ability, Stone Missile, which is a random target avoidable AoE with a 1.5 second cast that is used every 5 seconds. This ability deals nature damage as well as a knockback effect to players caught in the AoE. Stone Missile won't recast if you stop the cast with a crowd control ability, but since the ability is so frequent and easily avoidable, stopping it isn't a priority when you are doing trash pulls in this dungeon. On the other hand, Flash Frost Earth Shapers look like dwarf casters, and they are a lot more dangerous. These melee enemies only have one ability, Tectonic Slam. Tectonic Slam has a 4 second cast time, and it deals a large amount of AoE nature damage, as well as having a knockback effect, to all players within 40 yards of a successful cast. It can be used as frequently as every 17 seconds, and it does not recast when stopped by crowd control abilities, so you will want to prioritize stopping this ability from ever successfully casting. Flash Frost Chill Weavers are Night Elf caster enemies that will generally be spamming Ice Bolts on the highest threat target that deals single target frost damage. These are interruptible 2 second casts with no cooldown, so these enemies won't move unless you interrupt them or if you are line of sighting their abilities. Outside of Ice Bolts, they can also channel Ice Shield on allies, giving them a stacking absorb shield as well as CC immunity which can be a problem if they stop you from interrupting Tectonic Slam from the Earth Shapers. Interrupts and crowd control abilities on the Chill Weaver can stop this channel effect, though you can also magic dispel the shield buff on the allied enemy unit to stop the channel as well. In any case, Ice Shield can be used up to every 22 seconds, and it will save you time in the dungeon to stop this channel as soon as possible. Infused Whelplings are a low health enemy that appears naturally in this first section, and more will also spawn if any player moves through the dragon eggs on the outside of the room. Other than their weak melee attacks, Infused Whelplings will attempt to cast Cold Claws on their threat target as often as every 11 seconds, which deals single target frost damage and applies a stack of Primal Chill. This ability is kickable, and it will not recast when interrupted with crowd control effects. As for Primal Chill, it is mostly a harmless stacking snare effect that can be magic dispelled. But if anyone reaches 10 stacks of this effect, they will be stunned by the frozen solid effect for 3 seconds, which will also cause the player to take significant frost damage over the duration. However, even if you happen to be fighting a large amount of infused whelplings at the same time, only one infused whelpling is allowed to cast cold claws at any given time so there will never be a situation where you go from 0 to 10 stacks in an instant. So, as long as your healer is regularly dispelling the tank, they will never be frozen solid. Immediately before the first boss, you will encounter Defire Draghar, a dual-wielding mob with heavy-hitting attacks. His first ability is Flurry, which is an 8-hit melee combo over 3 seconds on the tank that is used every 18 seconds. In addition to the melee damage on the tank, every hit that connects will spawn a Molten Steel Avoidable AoE Circle on a random target that deals fire damage if anyone gets hit by it. His remaining ability is Blazing Rush, which is a 2.5 second cast on a random player that results in a charge attack in their direction, dealing initial physical damage, applying a bleed effect, and knocking back all players that remain in the effect. 
Furthermore, if these players hit are in unfortunate positions, this could cause them to get knocked into the dragon eggs that spawn more infused whelplings. Just be careful when you are in melee range when he is casting this ability, since the hitbox on the charge is bigger than you might think. After the first boss, one of the most dangerous enemies that you'll run into is Thunderhead, a proto-dragon mini-boss. His first ability is Storm Breath, where he will cast and channel a frontal cone ability in the direction of a random target for pulsing nature damage. This ability has a 2 second cast, a 45 yard range, and it is used as frequently as every 14 seconds. So your main counterplay is staying close enough to Thunderhead so you can easily sidestep the breath. His second ability is Thunderjaw, a hybrid physical and nature damage tank buster that has a strong knockback effect. This ability has a 1 second cast time and it is used as often as every 19 seconds, so it should be easy to line up defensive cooldowns. And beyond that, it may be a good idea to tank him near a wall to negate the knockback effect if you have no other way to avoid it. Thunderhead's final ability is called Rolling Thunder, which places magic dot debuffs on two random targets that last for 8 seconds. The tricky part of this ability is that, whenever a dot debuff expires or is removed in any way, a large amount of nature damage is dealt in a 100 yard AoE. So, the intended strategy is likely that you want to remove and trigger one debuff as soon as possible so that there is time to top up the groove before the second debuff explodes. You can also pre-immune the cast to try and prevent one of the debuffs from applying altogether, preventing one of these large explosions from going off. Even if the debuff doesn't land directly on you, this immunity will still be useful in immuning the first explosion and making your healer's job easier. In any case, these debuffs go out every 21 seconds. A large number of weak fire elemental enemies called Scorchlings can be found throughout this entire area before the second boss. These small elementals have only one ability, Burning Touch, which is a fast casting, interruptible spell that places a stacking fire dot on their threat target. This ability will recast if you stop it with other types of crowd control, the cast frequency is every 22 seconds, and the debuff duration is 10 seconds. So you shouldn't have too many issues with the stacking dot getting out of control, though the debuff can be removed with magic dispels in any case if it's needed. The first humanoid enemy you will encounter in this area are Primalist Cinderweavers. These are caster enemies that will generally be spamming Cinderbolt, a single target damage ability that is cast on a random target. These casts are interruptible and have a 40 yard range, but they have no cooldown. Most abilities of this type tend to be rather dangerous at higher key levels, so it may be a good idea to shut down these casts as much as possible. As for their second ability, Burning Ambition, they will attempt to buff themselves once every 25 seconds. Burning Ambition is a 1 second cast that does not recast when stopped with crowd control, though even if the cast succeeds, you also have the option of using a magic dispel on it to remove the effect. The buff lasts for 20 seconds, increases their haste by 50%, and causes them to take 25% more damage. And, while the increased damage taken is nice for us, the haste buff means they will cast Cinderbolts much faster, so it might not be worth the trade-off, nor is it a good idea to pull too many of these enemies at the same time. The second humanoid trash mob in this area are called Primalist Fire Dancers, who are dual-wielding melee enemies. Their primary ability is Flame Dance, which is a 4 second channeled ability on their threat target. While the channeled ability does periodic fire damage to the tank, if the channel completes without being crowd controlled, it ends in a 300 yard AOE fire damage effect, so you may want to go out of your way to stop that part from occurring. Fire Dance is used every 18 seconds, so you will need a good amount of crowd control to prevent the full cast from going off, especially if there are more than one active in any given pull. When reduced to zero health, they will also perform a 6 second channel before dying called Blaze of Glory. This will deal consistent pulsing damage if you are within 3.25 yards of the Fire Dancers, and it will spawn several avoidable AoE zones in the surrounding area. There's nothing you can do to stop this cast, and they will die once it is over. The second of the two Proto Dragon mini bosses is Flame Gullet. His first ability is Flame Breath, which, for all intents and purposes, is a carbon copy of Thunderhead's Storm Breath we talked about earlier except that it deals fire damage instead of nature damage. 
while his second ability, Fire Maw, is somewhat similar to Thunderhead's Tank Buster, though it does have some important differences. The initial damage is a little lower, it does not have a knockback effect, and the cast frequency is left less often at every 23 seconds. However, it does apply a 10 second fire dot that deals a significant amount of damage instead. Finally, when you damage Flame Gullet below 50% health, he will begin pulsing AoE fire damage every 2 seconds in a 60 yard radius that increases in damage by a flat 40% after every pulse. So, while this dragon isn't too dangerous when he is above 50% health, you will want to try to kill him as soon as possible once you push him below 50%. The main objective for this section is to kill all four Blazebound Destroyers. These giant fire elementals have a few abilities, the first of which is Living Bomb. Living Bomb is a random target debuff that is used every 18 seconds. It is a 6 second dot effect that causes its target to explode for AoE damage and a knockup effect once the dot expires. Interestingly enough, this final AoE also works on the humanoid primalist enemies. So, as long as you aren't killing any of your group members in the process, you can attempt to use it to deal some extra damage and to interrupt some of the primalist casts. Beyond that, Blazebound Destroyers will use their Inferno ability every 20 seconds. This ability has a 3 second cast and it will result in large AoE fire damage in addition to a fire dot to all players within 50 yards. Interestingly enough, this ability can be line of sighted, at least by using some of the line of sight spots available near the stairs. So it is possible that line of sight strategies get used on this enemy if Inferno ends up dealing a significant amount of damage. The final ability that these destroyers use is called Burnout, which is another on-death ability. This ability has a 5 second cast time and will deal a large amount of fire damage to anyone who remains within the 20 yard AoE when the cast completes. You can also line of sight this ability while remaining within 20 yards if you want, but I'm not sure if there's much need to do that. Finally, there is one more enemy in this section that you will most likely not want to fight at all. Hidden on the inside of the ring are four Primalist Shock Casters. These enemies spam cast Lightning Bolt on their threat target, though they sporadically use this ability on other targets if they get two off in a row. It is a kickable ability with a two second cast and a 40 yard range. Their second ability is Unlucky Strike, a nature dot curse effect that deals a particularly large amount of single target nature damage when it expires. This curse is used every 12 seconds, and the damage is quite brutal unless you have a way to remove curses. Finally, they have Thunderstorm, a 20-yard AoE damage and knockback ability that passively occurs around them every 17 seconds. On top of the fact that these enemies are immune to most forms of crowd control, I see little reason to ever fight them. Before fighting the final boss, we will run into a number of new trash enemies, the first of which are Storm Warriors. As it turns out, the Storm Warriors aren't too complicated. They are simple melee enemies that have a single Thunderclap ability. Every 8.5 seconds they will attempt to cast Thunderclap, which deals nature damage in a 5 yard AoE around them and applies a 10% haste and 20% movement speed debuff to all targets hit. They will recast this ability if you attempt to crowd control them during its 1 second cast, though it is very likely that snare immunity buffs will make you immune to the thunderclap altogether, and that snare removal effects can be used to remove the debuff. As for primal thunderclouds, they are mostly harmless small wind elementals. Right out of the gate, you will notice that a majority of their health is a magic dispellable absorb shield called storm barrier. But, as soon as this dispel effect expires, they will attempt to cast an ability called Crackling Detonation. Crackling Detonation is a 1.5 second cast that will attempt to recast if you stop it with any form of crowd control. If this cast succeeds, they will immediately charge to a random player and blow themselves up, causing a large avoidable AoE damage effect in a 3 yard AoE. Tempest Channelers are a stronger caster type enemy that spams Thunderbolt when they aren't casting other abilities. Thunderbolt is a 1.5 second cast ability that is interruptible and it will only cast on the current threat target for single target nature damage. Since it has a range of 30 yards, she won't move much on her own unless you kick her or line of sight her initial casts. Her first cooldown ability is Summon Primordial Thundercloud, which does exactly what you think it would do. 
This summoning can be cast as often as every 13 seconds, and there is nothing you can do to stop it from happening. Her last and most impactful ability is Lightning Storm, which deals AoE nature damage to all players within 100 yards over the duration of 6 seconds. This ability is used every 16 seconds, and before you get any ideas, it doesn't look like you can use Line of Sight to avoid it. Compared to Tempest Channelers, Flame Channelers are a lot more controllable as dual-wielding melee casters that are vulnerable to most types of crowd control effects. Their primary ability is called Flash Fire, which is where, after a 2 second cast, they will channel on a random target for up to 6 seconds, dealing pulsing AoE fire damage every second to everyone within 5 yards of the target, and leeching 3% of the damage done back to the Flame Channeler. This ability is used every 12 seconds, and it's interruptible during both the windup as well as the actual channel. Additionally, they will instantly apply Burning Veins to themselves every 12 seconds, which is a 9 second buff that increases their haste by 50% at the cost of them taking fire damage over time. This buff effect can be removed with Magic Dispel effects. The final trash mob of the dungeon is High Channeler Rivati. While she has a lot of cooldown abilities, she will spam Shock Blast outside of those cooldowns an interruptible 1 second cast single target damage ability that applies a nature dot to the target. This ability has no cooldown, and she will prefer targets who do not already have the dot applied to them. As for her first ability, we have Lightning Storm, which is exactly like the version used by the Tempest Channelers, except she only uses it every 22 seconds instead of every 16 seconds. Her next cooldown ability is also similar to Tempest Channelers with Summon Primordial Thundercloud. The only difference is that she uses Summon Primordial Thundercloud four times in a row whenever she decides to cast it, and she will do this once again every 22 seconds. Immediately after summoning the Primordial Thunderclouds, she will cast Tempest Storm Shield, an ability with a 3 second windup and a 6 second channel. As soon as the 3 second windup finishes, all remaining storm barriers in the surrounding primordial thunderstorms will combine into an absorb shield on high channel of Rivati. And if this absorb shield remains on her after the 6 second channel completes, it will explode in a 50 yard AoE. That being said, her channel will immediately end as soon as you break the absorb shield, and the shield size is basically nothing if there are no storm barriers left for her to steal at the end of her initial 3 second cast. And there you have it, that is all of the trash mechanics in Ruby Life Pool. If you would like to make it easier for other players to find this content, feel free to like this video and subscribe to the channel. If you have any questions, if there are any additional topics you'd like to see in the future, or if you have any opinions of your own about Ruby Life Pool trash mechanics, I'd like to hear your opinions in the comments below. I can also be contacted through Discord, and my information can be found in the video description. In the meantime, good luck, and have fun.